Hi, it's Randy Wicker. I'm here at Gay Expo, visiting with Blood Moon Productions, one of the major gay publishing houses in the country who puts out real cutting edge, uh, all sorts of cutting edge books on gay themes, the untold story of Hollywood stars and all that. And this is and this is Mr. Danford Prince, who I interviewed before, but he just continues to make news. So what's new with you, Danford? Oh, Randy, thank you very much, Randy. That's awfully nice. We have a new book out on J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, we have published a a biography, which was a response to the way he was portrayed in the Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> oh, I missed that. How was he portrayed? Well, he was portrayed rather delicately, um, but the movie, of course, is a movie, and we are a book, and we have 500 pages, and they had two and a half hours. We so respect them as filmmakers, but we felt very strongly that the story had not been told completely about the gay life, the secret gay life, the exhib exhibitionistic gay life of J. Edgar Hoover. Um, we the author of this is Darwin Porter. Yeah, I read. I read a lot of details. Supposedly, um, Hoover went in drag and all this type of thing. Tell me some of the outlandish stories. Because frankly, I'm not totally convinced on all of them. I have my own theories about Jagger Hoover. Oh, I'd like to hear that. I think the book illustrates a, a, an almost karmic moral tale, and that is the the the, the sense of, of of shame which one which is visited upon both the uh, blackmailer and his victim. Them, and the corrosive effects of that shame. We present. Well, Edgar Hoover was supposedly the biggest blackmailer in the world. That's why no one could get rid of him. He had the goods on everybody else. On everybody. Um, evidently, if there was anyone who made a peep about his homosexual life, which was rather well known, rather widely breathed around, he would threaten to investigate whatever senator has, was was taking graft on the side. He had files on everyone. Um, if some of these stories about J. Edgar had 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 been happening today, they would have been all over the front page of CNN. Our job at Blood Moon is to take the scandals of yesteryear and bring out the unmentionable word, the gay and lesbian side of these scandals, which amazingly has not been particularly well publicized as it relates to J. Edgar. Well, you know, I, I, I started my speaking career at City College, ah. and a guy who had exposed J. Edgar Hoover a year before was also a speaker there, day before the same time. He didn't get as big a turnout as I did as a gay spokesman in 1963. Yes. But he said, the J. Edgar Hoover, if he shook your hand and he felt you had a sweaty palm, that went on your record. In other words, he didn't want to hire you if when he shook your hand he felt like human moisture on the palm of your oh, hand. Oh, such arbitrary ways to judge people. <laughs> so Count I always thought he was extremely repressed because my best friend Jack Nichols was the son of an FBI man. And Jack wouldn't go duck hunting with him because he thought his father, who was an FBI agent, was going to take him duck hunting and shoot him on purpose. Oh my God. Well, I think we've opened the door to a series of stories about J. Edgar from the Lavender Underground. We, we, we really did mine what I call the lavender hip of, of, of show business in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, if you are going to begin investigating the sex lives of a lot of very hip people, it is inevitable that they will begin talking about you. Um, so an awful lot of people in Hollywood were gossiping about Ed, J. Edgar. Um, for example, he became close friends with many people in showbiz. Um, Ethel Merman was a very close friend of his. Dorothy L'Amour was a very close friend of his. Um, I think they sought his advice. I heard, I heard didn't he take uh, yacht trips around Long Island with the right, uh, Cardner, Card with um, uh, Cohen? With Roy Cohen. Roy Cohen and oh. also the Archbishop or, or uh, something. Spellman, yes, Nellie Spellman, I think they called that. Very flamboyant gay Archbishop of New York. You know, I, I, Spellman. I'm not trying to be combative. I just <laughs> tell you that I think that sometimes gay tongues wag and sort of amplify more than is really there. We do our best to put a control on that, but we also apply the standards we'd apply to any newspaper trying to accumulate several sources for the same anecdote. I'm not, I'm not putting you down, I'm just saying, you know, I'm going to be buried with Jagger Hoover and Clyde Tolson. Buried? They, what tell you mean? They are buried in Congressional Cemetery in yeah. Washington, D.C., and I have a three-plot 
there on the entrance. Dude. And it's funny, Jagger Hoover is here. They're only a grave or two separating him from Clyde Tolson. Really? And around Jagger Hoover's grave, there's a metal fence yes. and there's a box where you can punch a button or call a number and hear the story of who Jagger Hoover was. Really? And the people that run the graveyards, he didn't have this in your book, you didn't talk to me. <laughs> and the, the, the doors have opened. <laughs> and, and the, <laughs> well, they closed shut in the graveyard. But anyway, uh, they said that there were times that black windowed cars would come out and sit and visit Jagger Hoover's grave. And who who, who was Assume, in? Assuming they were secret agents or something. I see. And uh, there is a bench there too. If you want to go and pay your respects, you can go and talk to Jay Hoover. Well, we should make up, he and I. Perhaps he would forgive me for all the stories we've released about him. <laughs> well, he probably would want to be moved because another couple graves down is Gunnar Makovic's grave that says they gave me a, a star for killing two men and a dishonorable discharge for loving one. Oh. And right off of Gunnar Makovic's grave is the founder of the Boy Scouts, oh my. who one of the guides of the cemetery said the only thing straight about him was his gravestone. Well, you can always get a good gossip fest by going to a graveyard, I always say. <laughs> they, can't, they can't sue you from the grave, can they? What is your link to that graveyard? Were you a veteran that you would be buried in that No, graveyard? I want to be buried there. Uh, I'm uh, Frank Kameny's there, Leonard Makovitz there. I see. Uh, J. Philip Sousa's there. It's a national monument. Yes, indeed. And I want to... This is the Arlington National Cemetery? No, no. no. Congressional. Uh -huh. It's 18 blocks from the, from the Capitol building, and it was overgrown, and they have a very active LGBT, they even have an LGBT tour there. Oh, really? And they have tours, military tours, American Indian tours. Uh, I mean, they have, they have an amazing, amazing history. You look it up on the internet, I'll send you some links. So I, mean, I didn't mean to get off on all that. So now when you publish a book like this, how I've seen this book written up and reviewed uh, with a lot of juicy tidbits thrown in the reviews. There are, yes, there are indeed. But but th 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 we are publishing a tabloid treatment of of, of, a, of a life for whom there was no tabloid treatment when, of course, he was uh, committing all these atrocities. No one, no one dared. No one dared. He would have you investigated, he would have your taxes audited, you would be in really very serious trouble if you ever brought up the gay and lesbian aspect of J. Edgar Hoover during the peak of his power. I believe... How has the book been going? Have the reviews been generally good? Have there been a mix, mixed I think, No, I think they've been very positive. I, I believe that we have done no more than publish truths which were widely known out there in the community about people who knew um, J. Edgar. There are many books about J. Edgar Hoover, but none of them really approach it from this, this is my words, the lavender hip aspect of discussing, daring to discuss the sexual aspect of his life. I, I have an idea. I think that we should have a, um, now that gay marriage is legal, we should have a mock a post-humanist uh, marriage ceremony between J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde because but we because you know love and respect for the love they held for one another, which was they, evidently considerable. They were called the twins. They went everywhere together. Yes, three meals a day. And if only they had, if only they had died together, Tolson went back and burned all the files when J. Edgar Hoover died. So most of what they, a lot of what they had was lost. Indeed, I think Clyde spent the last four years of his life. He survived J. Edgar by four years, systematically destroying the private files accumulated by J. Edgar, which were often for voyeuristic interest, prurient interest, many, many times of movie stars. Now, now, do you think, though, there's any chance, this was just a theory that I had someone tell me, in which I thought could be a possibility, that they obviously had a home, I'll call it a homosexual relationship, because they were two males, lived together night and day, worked together, in other words, their lives were one, like a married couple. Well, I think people... But, but could it be, could it have been a guilt-ridden, uh, non-sexual relationship? That will probably be between them and God, but I really sort of doubt it. They were both heavy drinkers, and at the beginning of a passionate friendship, there would probably have been a sexual expression of one kind or another. So there was relationships of all kinds proceed many times to become less sexual, but the emotional were, bond was very definitely there. How long were they together? Oh, I forget. Was it um, 48 years, I believe. A long so they, so they started as young men. It, we, the author interviewed um, people who knew both of them jointly together. There were an awful lot of witnesses who saw them together at the Stork Club, holding hands. Um, supermodels of their era would rush forward to be photographed with uh, J. Edgar uh, to give the impression, of course, that he was indeed uh, heterosexual dating. Um, uh, 
whatever supermodel was running around well, the tell, at the time. Um, you're going to get a lot of flack because I can tell you I did that interview well, with I, I, about I, Michael Jackson <laughs> and it's very interesting. It gets a number of hits on YouTube and there is a very definite divide of people. Michael Jackson has those people who are his fans who think any inference that he ever touched anybody who ever had any kind of sexual relationship or something is outside of marriage or something is horrible and others other people think that he's the worst pedophile that ever lived. Well, our book on Michael Jackson was a fair portrayal of presenting sides to the argument and allowing the reader to judge whether or not Michael had indeed molested. Are more. there two sides on this? No, it's it's really rather rather clear that the, the, the book is actually a, 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 a biography of a vindictive, self-loathing homosexual who was more punitive toward sub subversives within the American context of any kind than any of his predecessors. Um, I, I think that it is indeed a lesson in homosexuals who self-loathe and the degree to which they punish other perceived homosexuals. There's a long history of that. Um, recently, that's... As, as a proud gay man myself, I'm very alert to the punitive effects of, of that on by, by closeted homosexuals who are terrified of it within their own. So if there's a benefit to this, it indeed points out years of abuse. It, it, it's unfortunate that the FBI got caught up in this, but it did. Well, you know Cornell, is it Cornell or Cordell Hall? Yes, I do know a lot about he, him. He, wasn't he the Secretary of State? What was he? He was a big, a big official in FDR's cabinet who actually uh, was written up in a confidential magazine where supposedly we'd get yeah, drunk now, and go out and offer guys money to go to bed with him. Sumner, Sumner, uh, Sumner Wells, I believe. Cordell Hull was Sumner Wells' enemy, and I believe that the man who did that was Sumner Wells, who, that, that's a very complicated story. He was indeed a practicing homosexual. Uh, he was entrapped by JFK on a railway car with a porter, um, and his career was destroyed, and it is argued that his Sumner uh, Wells had controlled the Latin American policy of America in the um, post-war years that we would have a happier relationship with Latin America in general, but as a gay man he was persecuted and replaced with more punitive replacements. Okay, and now he, uh, J Latin America is horrible. J. Edgar Hoover wasn't involved in that, even tangentially, he just was, in other words, it wasn't anything that J. Edgar Hoover got involved in having Cornell. I think, I think that J. Edgar took copious notes on this and compiled files which could then be used to blackmail Sumner for, for all kinds of purposes, including taking a hard line anti-communist view against Latin America. It got very murky, very complicated. When did he die? Uh, um, uh, 72, I believe. Uh, oh, he was there when Harold Jenkins, who was LBJ's big aide, all these congressional aides get all this scandal going, was called in the YMCA. Oh, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Baker? Are you no, about Bobby no, Baker? Howard, Harold Jenkins was worked this for may LBJ. Be more esoteric than I can cope with. He, so sorry. He, he was caught in the YMCA bathroom in Washington, D.C. Oh, and was bounced out of Washington, and LBJ was loyal to him and gave him a job running his businesses in Austin, Texas. Well, I think I think many, many things. This is one of many anecdotes about aberrant, if you like, sexuality within the government that JF that um, J. Edgar um, tolerated or fomented. Or I, I, what I'd like to say is a sense of shame that used to permeate sexual activity of any kind and gay activity in particular. And if there's a benefit. To to this book, it will hopefully erase the sense of shame that is an automatic knee-jerk reaction to that of a um, employee in the public eye in the government service. He was going after Martin Luther King. Yes. Because Jagger right. Hoover had all the goods about Martin Luther King being in motel rooms. He had recordings. So you know maybe we cover that to some degree in the book. Yes. We cover a life. Did he? Did he? Because I remember he said that's the most dangerous man in America after the I Have a well, Dream. That would be very typical of a reaction that Jay Edgar would have to that, and I think that Nixon was at first grateful for the protection that, that, that J. Edgar provided him, but eventually began to view J. Edgar's involvement in various brewing sex scandals as too hot to handle. Nixon informed JFK that he, 
Nixon informed J. Edgar that he would be fired. Uh, that night, J. Edgar had a massive stroke and died the next morning. Um, oh, really? Yes. Is that verified or is that just maybe another juicy rumor? No offense intended. Another what? I mean, is it verified that Nixon was going to fire J. Edgar Hoover? Uh, I believe it was indeed in the cards. And Tricky yeah. Dicky, the big crook? I would think he had so much on Tricky Dicky. I think that J. Edgar's involvement in some brewing sexual revelations was hotter than, J. That, than Nixon wanted to handle. So anyway, is this the main book right now, or is there something else? I see the Kennedys over there. We have a book coming out in June, which is very exciting. It's Maryland at Rainbow's End. We are publishing a book in June, which is a roundup of the conspiracy theories associated with the death of Marilyn Monroe, and a complicated, murky brew that it is. The book analyzes the characters operating in the last couple of years of her life, then occurs the death, then occurs the degree to which all the stories conflicted with one another in a, in a murky morass. Of this is tabloid publishing, folks. But, you know, that's what that's what the world loves. I mean, people want to know the saucy story. They don't want it all like very simple, plain, unimaginative telling of what actually happened. Well, I, I think that the tabloid treatment of, of celebrities is a relatively new phenomenon. That, that's their business, though. That, that, celebrities are tabloid. And we at Blood Moon apply the, the, uh, the, the tabloid treatment to the scandals of yesteryear, publishing widely known information breathed around social circles that have never really been published before, whether out of a sense of shame uh, that the, we must only speak good of the dead, or a sense of uh, fear and shame about analyzing these these anecdotes which may be of a sexual nature, we really are the first in America to really start doing this very aggressively. So so where where should people go to buy the book? Is it on sale Amazon or would it be better to get it from you? No, we've got very good distribution through the National Book Network who are really very nice to us. And the books are out there on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, online. Um, if you search for them online, up will come where they can be uh, acquired. We've also got books on the Kennedys and Frank Sinatra. We've got two scandal guides. Uh, the the, the ultimate gossip guide to six of the famous Kennedys and, and, and released at a time when the canonization of the Kennedys has been never stronger. We did a rundown of all the scandals associated with them and quite I, I un it is. I understand that uh, the young Kennedy, John F. Kennedy Jr., John the one that died, yes. you know, crashed the plane, yes. that he really did it because as many uh, early flyers, they overestimate their ability to control a plane. Oh, it was a tragic death indeed. Human error in a small craft, it's notorious, yes. You think someone that had everything, fame, fortune, possible power. Like you, Randy, yes. <laughs> We're very grateful for your coverage. We're Blood Moon Productions. We are indeed salvaging the oral histories of Hollywood's underbelly before the source material dies forever. How could you forget the name Blood Moon? We published a um, erotic. Get drunk thriller. one night and look up and see a red moon. How did that name ever come about? Well, in the Middle Ages, a blood moon was indeed a sign that Christ was being crucified all anew, and the residents of villages throughout Europe would rush into the local cathedral and pray and scream and tremble until the eclipse is a lunar eclipse had passed. And when the radical right comes to crucify you at home on Staten I Island, all pray the, for me and uh, for, for publishing the scandalous book about one of their heroes. Uh, we can look up and we will see the moon turn blue. Uh, and maybe by finest hour. <laughs> okay, well, is there anything else you want to say? I'm very grateful for your coverage and for looking at our product. Oh, quit giving. Well, okay, bloodmoonproductions.com on the internet, folks. I can tell you it's a great read. Uh, you, is there any chance a book like this gets turned into a movie, or is it just too hot to put on film? I think that as, as standards evolve, that, 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 that allow me to say. In the old days, if you printed salacious stories about any co subject you covered in a, in a biography, you were condemned for speaking ill of the dead. But by modern um, academic standards, if you know something pivotal about the psychology of the, of the subject you're covering, and you don't include it, you are being academic 
academically irresponsible. Yeah, I've seen and, I've seen movies about Liberace and Rock Hudson that were pretty no, specific. They, no, they, they showed the they either. showed the no, they showed the boys swimming around in the pool. They were very open about it. I was surprised. Oh well, that's very good. Um, we almost believe that if you don't, things are changing. Things are, they are changing very very fast, and I think modern readers are sophisticated enough that they don't accept it if you don't cover this vital part of their of their psychology. The whole story and nothing but the whole story. We do our best. <laughs> okay, so this has been Randy Wicker from Gay Expo talking with Danford Prince of Blood Moon Productions. Thank you for listening. Thank you all of you. Thank you very much, Randy.